Good evening, everyone, and welcome to UCLA Anderson. My name is Laurie Santikin. I'm the faculty director of the UCLA Fink Center for Finance and a professor of finance and strategy here at Anderson. On behalf of the Fink Center, the UCLA Anderson Masters in Financial Engineering, and the entire UCLA Anderson family, I'm thrilled to welcome you to this very special event. The UCLA Fink Center for Finance aims to cultivate and translate innovation at the frontiers of finance. We do this by supporting and disseminating cutting edge research, connecting academia with industry and policy, and training leaders along their professional journey. Today, we are privileged to partner with Women Investing in Security and Education to bring to our community insights from some of the most impressive individuals in finance who just coincidentally happen to be women. This event would not be possible without the dedication and commitment of women investing in security and education. So I'd like to introduce Angela Daly, co-president of WISE, to introduce our program. Hi, hello everyone. Thank you, Lori, for the kind words and that great introduction. We are so excited to be partnering with UCLA and the Anderson School and the Fink Center on what promises to be a fun, fascinating, and very educational meeting tonight. In 1997, a group of women met in Orange County to put on an investing conference for women. They were amazed that 500 women signed up for this event, so they knew they were on for something. Fast forward 25 years, or just about 25 years, and we're still faithful to our mission of financial education for females of all ages and all socioeconomic backgrounds, because we believe that managing your finances better leads to better outcomes, more options, and the ability to fulfill your dreams. In the past year, WISE hosted or participated in about 20 workshops and events, reaching about 1,500 women, actually now across the country, thanks to our virtual format. We work with organizations such as Girl Scouts, Girls Inc., and universities such as UCLA. Tonight's program is part of our groundbreaking Tearing Down the Pink Wall series, whose mission is both education and inspiration. We gather the best and the brightest in financial services to inspire all of us to achieve our full potential. And the best and the brightest are exactly what we have tonight. We have an extraordinary panel. We have Jane Buchan, CEO at Martlet Asset Management. We have Katie Sherritt, CEO, Research Affiliates, and Andrea Einsfeld, a professor of finance here at UCLA's uh, Anderson School. All these women have impeccable credentials, but they're also very committed and passionate about financial literacy and also advancing women and minorities in the workplace. According to Morningstar, only about 11% of portfolio managers are females. And this has nothing to do with performance because they perform as well or better than their peers. And what's really disturbing about this number is it hasn't moved in the past decade. In fact, some surveys show it's going the wrong way. In the C-suite, the numbers are even <laughs> more disturbing. 3% of CEOs in financial services are female. So we have a long way to go. Uh, tonight, we have a two-part program. Uh, first, we're going to hear market insights, and then we're going to hear about the career journeys of our panelists and uh, how, they, how they got into the C-suite in this rarefied uh, uh, position that they are in. But first, I'm going to introduce our moderator, Consuelo Mack, the host and founder of PBS's Wealth Track. Consuelo and I go back a very long way. We met when we were both starting our careers in New York City. She in financial journalism and me on the dark side in public relations for a large and controversial investment bank. So our paths would cross many times over the years, sometimes not happily for me, but we became very close friends and we remain close friends. Consuela is recognized as a pioneer in financial journalism. She was an anchor on CNBC and now hosts her own show on PBS Wealth Track, whose mission is to help all Americans both build and preserve their wealth. She's a big advocate of, of women and minorities in the workplace, especially in financial services. So 
With that, please join me in welcoming Consuelo, our distinguished panel, and two bits of housekeeping. Please put your questions uh, in the Q&A box, not the chat box. We're going to get to them at the end of the meeting. And if you want to join the networking event at 530, even if you didn't register, the link will be in the chat box. So with that, Consuelo, showtime. <laughs> Thank you, Angela, and it is a treat to be with you as always. And you know the view from the top and influential women in finance. You are definitely one of them. So um, I'm just delighted to be here, and I want to thank UCLA uh, Anderson School of Management. I also want to thank thank Wise. I didn't realize it's been since 1997. Uh, I've certainly been involved uh, from the very beginning as well. And also this Tearing Down the Pink Wall series because, um, you know, we're all here together to, uh, to make sure that everybody succeeds uh, and that women uh, especially succeed in the financial services industry. And um, I am really honored to be here. Uh, and as I said, with the, you know, these influential women in finance, uh, and we are definitely going to get their view from the top. And we are here with a common mission, which is uh, financial literacy, which is what uh, WISE is all about, uh, what the Anderson School of Management is all about as well, and, uh, and what WISE does in, in preparing women uh, as well, and both of them for leadership positions uh, in this incredible industry. And I just uh, have to say, it, it's what the three panelists uh, represent. And uh, it's not just for women, it's for, for everyone. And, you know, I've, I come from the financial services industry. I was a broker at one point and a, uh, a minor portfolio manager and an analyst. And, um, and financial security is key uh, to, uh, to success. It's a critical, critical component of both personal and, uh, and also professional success. So it's in a very important mission that we all share. Um, and leadership in the financial services industry, well, despite the numbers that, uh, that Angela just read you, which are disheartening, uh, but my feeling is, and we'll ask our panelists, I think things are changing. And quite honestly, uh, that was you know, my experience in the early, early years, that the financial services industry uh, is incredibly dynamic, it's changing rapidly. And it's basically opening up uh, to, it's being much more inclusive. And if you've got basically the talent and the ambition, and if you can deliver results, uh, it presents tremendous opportunities, which is why uh, the discussion tonight is so important. So let's get started and meet the panelists. And, and as uh, Angela said, it, it is a two-parter. We're gonna talk about kind of the, you know, the macro uh, outlook first and kind of the, you know, the, the hard economic reality and the market realities that we're facing. Uh, and then the second uh, part of the discussion is going to be about uh, the careers is basically how our panelists got where they are and the decisions they made along the way uh, and some advice that they can give to the rest of us. So uh, you saw their bios if, if you if in the role, the video that was rolling in the before we started this officially. Um, but I just want to give you some highlights, especially if you missed it. So I'm going to take a quick introduction of each of our panelists first with Jane Buchan, who, as uh, Angela said, is the CEO of Martlet Asset Management. It's an independent investment firm that she founded in 2018. And prior to that, uh, Jane was the CEO of PAMCO, which is a fund of hedge funds. And it started, she started in 2000. And under her leadership, um, you know, by the time that she left PAMCO, its assets had grown to uh, $32 billion. So it was, a, you know, a, quite a success story. She's, Jane is involved in numerous activities supporting, um, you know, financial literacy and supporting women in finance. Um, she is the chairwoman uh, of the board for the Chartered Alternative uh, Investment Analyst Association. She, she has that designation herself. It's CAIA. And uh, she's also on the advisory board uh, for the Master of Financial Engineering program at UCLA Anderson. And she got a PhD in finance at Harvard. Uh, she taught finance uh, as well at the Amos uh, Tech School, that, that's the business school at Dartmouth. And what I especially um, uh, want to highlight is that she has been named two years in a row of one of Barron's 100 most influential women in finance. 
Andrea Eisfeld, who I've, and I've talked, I've known Jane before, I've talked to her on other panels, but I'm delighted to introduce Andrea Eisfeld, who I just got to know, and I'm looking forward to talking to her a lot more in the future. She is the Lawrence D. and Lori Fink uh, Endowed Chair, the Professor Endowed Chair of Finance, where she is Professor of Finance at UCLA Anderson. And I, and I mentioned that chair, which is endowed by the Finks, because Larry Fink, of course, you might not know this, is the, uh, is the head of BlackRock, uh, which is the largest asset management and is driving a lot of um, important issues, which we will discuss as well and, and in corporate governance uh, and ESG, social responsible investing. So that's, that is one of the topics that we're going to discuss. And, and you know, she has won several prizes for her academic papers in the Journal of Finance and other places. Um, she's on the board of the American Finance Association. She spent nine years uh, in, in asset uh, management consulting, uh, one of which was at AQR, which is a very famous, uh, huge investment firm run by a uh, kind of a, a celebrity financier, uh, Cliff Asnes. And, um, and she, she was advising them on both equity and fixed income strategies, again, something we'll talk about. She was also the chief uh, economist for a hedge fund. Her uh, educational background is PhD in economics at the University of Chicago, and she's also advising firms on fintech financial technology, which is the, a big disruptive force in this industry. Again, another topic that we need to get to. Finally, Katie Sherrod, partner and CEO of Research Affiliates, that's a global asset manager and Research Affiliates is known for its award-winning research and innovative products, including something called fundamental indexation, which some of you might or might not know about, but fundamental indexation weighs stocks based on their fundamentals and things like their, the size of their sales and their profits and cash flow instead of market capitalization. So it, it, it senses that it, that it more, um, it better reflects really the economic you know, footprint of companies than just their market value. And there are $166 billion in assets worldwide using investment strategies created by research affiliates. And since 2006, Katie has been just about every leadership position that you can imagine at research affiliates and getting to CEO where she is now. Um, and before that, she spent 19 years at the CFA Institute, the Certified Financial Analyst Institute, as part of their leadership team. Uh, she has a PhD in finance from the Darden School, University of Virginia. She is a visiting professor there. Uh, she serves on lots of non nonprofits and lots of profit boards as well. And she was also named to Barron's 100 Most Influential Women in Finance over the last two years. So welcome to our panelist. It's definitely a view from the top. So thanks for being here. Um, and this is a two-part conversation, as I said. So we're going to start with the investment climate. And, and I wanted to you know, just kind of run down for all of you uh, just the big picture backdrop and, and just quickly, you know, we've got widespread vaccinations now, especially in the developed world, the US, in the US and the UK, uh, China, Europe, uh, and obviously real problems in some of the developing world, India and Brazil uh, among them. We've got economic reopenings and growth happening now. That's, it's global, again, centered mostly where the vaccinations have been more widespread. We've got unprecedented monetary and fiscal stimulus. Um, we've got record levels of government debt and corporate debt and you know, historically low interest rates still, booming stock markets, booming private markets. Um, there is a lot going on and we've got an exploding digital currency market as well. Um, you know, with Bitcoin uh, at a, a trillion dollar market value. So it's kind of, where do we start? And I wanted to start with Jane, because I want to ask each of you to, to tell us what, what you're focusing on, what you're talking with your colleagues about, and, and what you're talking, you're, you're teaching in your classes. What are the one to three top macroeconomic themes that you're paying attention to and you think we should pay attention to? So Jane, I'm going to start with you. I think one of the big macroeconomic themes is how high can the stock market go um, and also what's happening to interest rates. So while there's been a lot of talk about all sorts of things, whether it's been, you know, SPACs, uh, special purpose acquisition companies, like blank check crypt, companies, exactly, called, right? or cryptocurrency and stuff. I think we're back to the fundamental, you know, sort of what I call finance 101. 
you know, where are interest rates likely to go in terms of macroeconomic views and where, where is it, what's it mean for the stock market? Because I think clearly one of the things today is it's the low rates that are partially driving the stock market today. And do you want to answer those questions? (laughs) I'll I'll let you ask some of our fellow panelists. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, nice. Passing the buck. (laughs) So, Andrea, you're talking about all of these things in your finance classes. Um, Well, number one, in in all fairness to you, what are the top macroeconomic themes that you're focusing on and that we should pay attention to? And, And then we'll answer the questions that Jane raised. Okay, so I I need to echo Jane. I always say look to the bond markets first when you want to talk about macroeconomics. So uh, um, I'll come back to what's going on with interest rates. In equity markets, I think, you know, you hit on all of the things that are boosting the stock market, um, opening up vaccinations, all these new opportunities. Where are we going to go post-pandemic when we combine the best of both worlds, watching streaming TV and going on vacation? Um, you know, going on Zoom and and going to conferences. Um, headwinds in the equity markets would be things like uh, ta- corporate taxes. What's going to happen there? Are we going to meet somewhere between 20 and 30 at 25? Um, how are um, investors going to think about that? And then also regulation in particular. I'm always looking at what's going on with antitrust because we have a very concentrated um, uh, S&P 500 with a lot of value in the top five companies. And those are right. large companies with which uh, the government will always be having a close eye on. Um, so, just so, real- right. so, so a good alphabet, for instance, and Microsoft and Facebook and. Yeah, yeah. companies that have a, a lot of customer data right. and more than anyone else could hope to have in a very short amount of time. Yes. So, so, uh, Katie, from your perch at Research Affiliates, what are you all talking about? What are the big macro themes that you're talking about? Oh. We're not uh, a firm that focuses much on the macro. Uh, we're a systematic research-based firm. We're very rules-based and we believe in long-term trends rather than short-term trends. Right. I agree very much with what the other panelists, Jane and Andrea, have said in terms of what the issues are that we're facing now. Um, And I think ultimately that's partly why we think the U.S. equity market over the next 10 years is going to be flat, if if anything. Don't know whether it'll go up first and then down or down first and then up. But, you know, there, there are a lot of things that are going to have to be sorted out in these markets in the coming years. And um, we tend to be, go ahead. No, no. So, so right. So you, you think of, you know, long-term trends, there's no secular trends. There's no question about that. But I, I know in, you know, in talking to, uh, to Rob Arnott, the founder of Research Affiliates over the years, I know that, you know, you, you tend to look for undervalued assets. And so you've been looking at where the leadership has been in growth stocks that Andrea just talked about in the S&P 500, the concentration there. You've been looking at the fact that large cap companies, large companies have, have basically been leading the way and that small companies have, have been lagging. Uh, and also that U.S. markets have been leading again uh, and international markets have been, have been lagging. So those are things that you guys talk about. Absolutely. When, yeah. we, when we did the panel just a couple, well, six months ago, um, I made the comment that the difference between value and growth stocks was at a, a, just an all-time large gap. Right. It was the was biggest gap in history. Right. And that it would not last. And here we are six months later, and the value stocks, the cheaper unloved stocks, have been much stronger in the last six months, a, a more of a return to normal um, types of relationships. And so, yes, we definitely look at what's undervalued and what's not on what's overpriced. And right now, the U.S. market looks um, less attractive to a value or an investor than the riskier emerging markets or um, other parts of the world. Right. So and you're absolutely right. And it's just really hard. We, we often tend to be early. We, we see trends and are, uh, aren't great at, at actually timing them. So we do look at long-term valuation relationships. And, and Jane, in the, the alternative space, um, you know, I think, I mean, hedge funds, 
who wanted to hedge in like one of you know the greatest bull market of all time? I mean, it's just so hedge funds. This has not been the place to be, right? So talk to us about the alternatives that we have to the to the U.S. large cap tech oriented stock market. Um, talk to us about that. Opportunities yeah, I mean, there are. I mean, you're exactly right, um, on Consuelo. I mean, if it had been in 2008 and I'd had a perfect crystal ball, I would have been just long the S&P 500. I would have forgotten about overseas investing. I would have forgotten about bond markets. I would have forgotten about hedge funds. I frankly would have forgotten about private equity too. Um, you forgot about a lot of it. Uh, maybe not venture cap. That's a different story. But that's that's what it is. Now, the problem is, is I don't have my crystal ball or my crystal ball is broken or cloudy. And, you know, the problem is what we want to do is invest for the future. And while we've had some very big, sharp downs, they've come back pretty quickly. Um, even look at March of last year. You know, it was a terrible time. People were talking about, you know, the market's down 10, 20 percent. But it came back very, very quickly. And if I told you, if I told you on January 1st, we were going to be down the market 20% in a month. Plus, right. we were going to have one of the largest pandemics, probably at least in, in the U.S., more more destructive than than the, the influenza of, of 1918. You would have thought I was nuts um, saying the market's going to be up. You just you wouldn't believe it. And so I think what you have to do is be prudently diversified. I think that's one of the big differences between gambling and investing, and it you need to tie it to the fundamentals of the economy over the long term. Um, it's very tempting. Look at what happened um, with um, uh, GameStop. You know, it's very tempting to try to, to, to treat it like a casino. And I think that that's gambling with your money, not investing over the long haul. So that's that's another question, is that there are some very different things. I mean, well, they're not different. It kind of in any bull market of any length, there are always these bubbles that erupt and there are always kind of new innovative things that are happening. Um, and some of them have legs and some of them don't. So Andrea, when you're teaching, you know, finance at UCLA, you know, what are you telling uh, your students uh, about the some of the things that we're seeing in, in the markets today, and, and certainly GameStop and Robinhood, the kind of very speculative trading, momentum-driven, um, what does that signify to you in the markets? Yeah, that's it's an interesting question. I actually just lis listened to a, an interview of the founder of Robinhood and how disruptive the whole GameStop episode was because of the collateral that intermediaries have to put up for those trades. I think the democratization of finance um, is going to be one of the most exciting trends that we see going forward. I think it's going to make the value of a, an education in finance, you know, even more um, exciting and valuable. So I'm I'm excited about those things. I mean, I also I'm a finance professor with a um, very capital markets focused, market efficiency focused education. Right. Having worked in asset management, I still believe there. It, there can be alpha or excess returns in some parts of the market and you can't have mispricing, but I agree in that a diversified portfolio that's focused on being tax efficient and also has low costs um, is the way to go. Um, you know, one of the things I've been looking at a lot is the value of intangible assets. And I think that that's one thing that we saw maybe going wrong with uh, with value investing kind of over the the last 20 years or so is that we were ignoring those intangible assets. And, and so talk and now about in, intangible assets. You're talking about intellectual property. I mean, for, for people who are not, you know, familiar with kind of the, the balance sheet and the accounting side of things, um, what, are you, what are you talking about that you think uh, that we need to pay more attention to? Yeah, so so a lot of times with value investing, you're looking at the market value relative to the book value and, and accounting statements haven't changed much in hundreds of years. And companies look very different. So you invest in processes, logistics, uh, corporate culture, advertising you have brand value you have some software uh, that you know you, you maybe expend some r d and you have some value from that it may not be patented so all of these things organization capital customer capital brand capital 
um, intellectual property capital are not on the balance sheets of firms and drive a lot of future firm cash flows. So I think what we're seeing is, you know, kind of an attention to a different anchor for fundamental value. And Katie, this is kind of right up your alley um, because number one, you were at the CFA Institute, uh, you know, for for 19 years, and and there as a as a leader, as the CEO of Research Affiliates, you feel very strongly in corporate culture and in diversity and inclusion. So, you know, talk to us about the importance you think of these intangibles. Uh, first of all, how how important are they to you? Yeah, well, very important. Thank you, Consuelo. Yeah. Um, but let me go back just a step, and it relates a little bit to research in this area. I'm a big right. believer in collective intelligence and cognitive diversity, and the diversity can come in any different ways. But a group of us working together in a positive, curious manner are going to get to better outcomes, better decisions, miss some blind spots, mm -hmm. miss some mistakes that we didn't see because in our tunnel vision, uh, it wasn't evident, but it might what might not have been evident to me could have been ev evident to Andrea or Jane. And if we talk to each other, we miss some of those. And so- and, and can, can you give us an example, Katie, of in your experience of, of a situation where that has happened, that there would have been blind spots that you kind of all looked at each other and say, wow, we never thought of it that way. Well, there are lots of uh, conversations when you're yeah. you know, just in an investment company. Uh, many people are very attached to the research that they've done and they don't see uh, the potential pitfalls or the assumptions that were made that could be flawed. And when you share your research, it's, it's very common to share your research and get feedback from others. Um, and they'll say, well, what about this? Or that assumption may not be strong, or maybe you're missing something. And what about the data? And those conversations lead to refinements in the research, which for us lead to refinements in investment products. Um, and it just benefits. And any one person gets kind of in their own head. And it takes collaboration to bring out the best of people's right. ideas. Or if you can't solve a problem um, because you keep going at it the same way, talking to somebody else, if I come to you, Consuelo, and say, you know, I really, this is a really thorny problem. I can't figure it out. She, and you might just say, well, Katie, did you look left? I was like, no, I was going right. You know, and it just, if you just have that exchange, it leads to richer decisions and better better problems. And so for me, I think in, in companies where you have a very dominant leader who's not interested in other people's opinions, they're interested in being right and being proven right, uh, you run the increased risk of uh, making mistakes or missing some good opportunities. Yeah. And, and Jane, number one, do you want to comment on, on what Katie had just said? And, and, I'm, and I'm just thinking of the hedge fund industry, which is you know, predominantly male, and as is, you know, just about in the fun, in the money management business, it is predominantly male, and you are one of the exceptions. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, what, what Katie says is really true, is, but I think it's easy to talk about it, but it's much harder to do in practice. Over my career, yeah. I've evaluated thousands of asset managers, you know, because we were a fund of funds, so we gave money to managers. And everyone liked to see, um, you know, say they were competing against the market. But I can't tell you the number of firms that we found over the years when you actually went in and it was more about people telling the founders that they were right rather than bringing up differential opinions. And the fact of the matter is it doesn't matter what you think inside your firm because you're going to put your positions on and the market's going to tell you whether they pay off or not. So I always found the best firms were firms that really um, had active dialogue. But it's but on the other hand, from a managerial point, it's not like you just want random dialogue coming in. You know, you want to talk about the data. You want to say, have you thought about this or let me back this up? And I think one of the mistakes I've seen with people is they like just raising issues as opposed to having kind of worked through them and say, what about this different point? So, and I think it's really, those are the best investing firms. 
Yeah, I was going to say it's also it's it's hard to analyze, you know, I'm just from a CFA point of view or whatever. It's hard to analyze intangibles. But so I, I allowed us to stray in this conversation a little bit into part two of this um, of, of our panel discussion. So, Andrea, I want to go back to uh, a couple of points that we did discuss. And you wrote a, a, an article recently about uh, inflation and the return of possible return of inflation. Uh, you know, for the first time in over a decade, we're seeing, you know, in prices perk up in certain areas. And you said it's, it's a, you know, it, it's a cause can be a cause for celebration, whereas Wall Street is terrified of inflation because it usually is not good for stock prices because then the Fed raises interest rates and, you know, then the economy slows down. So talk to me about uh, inflation, how real do you think the pickup is, and also why we should be celebrating it? Sure. Okay. So um, first of all, I just actually, when I was answering one of the questions in the Q&A, thanks for asking that. Uh, about inflation, I just looked up the 10-year break-even inflation rate. So that's a kind of a something tells you something about expectation of inflation over the next 10 years, and it's right around two and a half percent. Okay. And I think the Fed is probably happy about that because the target is two percent, and you're talking over 10 years, and so you know they wanted to get a little bit of inflation. And, and they've been trying to get inflation since 2008, by the way, and were never successful. So I think inflation is a sign of increased demand, of increased growth, and of people getting jobs and wages having a little upward pressure. I think these are all things we should be excited about. And I also, you know, kind of on that note, um, there has been so much Fed watching. Fed watching has been around, you know, in asset management forever, forever but now right. we're all watching the Fed. You know, Main Street is watching the Fed. And I think, you know, the we want to watch fundamentals. We want to watch earnings. We don't want to rely on the Fed for high equity market valuations. We want those high equity market valuations to come from good cash flows. So, yeah, I think we should celebrate a little bit of inflation. And Jane, I, I want to ask you, in the alternative investment space, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, private equity. Uh, I mentioned hedge funds. Uh, you mentioned SPACs, these special purpose uh, acquisition companies, these blank check companies. Um, again, you know, the, the money has been flowing into these SPACs, into initial public offerings. What is, you know, what, do you, what does that tell you about the market and valuations in the market? I don't know about valuations. I'll defer that to Katie. But to me, it tells me people are people. You have a lot of institutional investors looking down the nose at retail investors regarding GameStop. Right. I think institutional investors are doing the exact same thing regarding SPACs. So, you know, you know, depends which foot you put your you put the shoe on, but I I I'd put that you, one you mean you Katie. mean they're speculating just like the rest of us. Right. Well, yeah, you you're yeah. buying you're buying shares of something you don't even know what it's going to do. I mean, right. it, it's crazy. But on valuation, I, I, Katie's by far the expert on that. Uh, Katie? <laughs> you, I'm not an expert, expert on, on that, this. But I would say for our audience, one of the salient points for me is that um, – it, it's really dangerous to follow what's popular as an individual investor. Um, uh -huh. More often than not, you'll lose. The research shows that individual investors that tend to chase performance and not even get the published time-weighted return. So all of these conversations, if it's not based on good fundamentals and, it's, and if it's overpriced, um, the odds are that you know, the investor that buys something they don't understand or that is very, very expensive um, relative to the underlying cash flows that Andrea was talking about um, are going to be hurt. And I think that's a, a core message that people should think about. If they don't understand it, or it's rather pricey, or they can't understand how they're making profit, then they probably shouldn't buy it. Right. Except that's not fun. And that's really boring, Katie. <laughs> And, <laughs> and I mean, you know, I, I would say, you know, I, th there used to be something called fun money. And so if, you know, maybe mo no more than 1% of your, you know, portfolio or whatever, you can put into these very hot, uh, you know, areas. And if you lose it, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, there's, there, there's a place for, um, for this kind of speculation if you put it in its proper proportion. 
Just don't count on that money for your retirement or your right. education or something like that. Right. So I, I want to talk a little bit about so investment strategy. And uh, Jane, I'm going to go back to you. Is uh, in, as far as you know, everybody's saying we should have a diversified portfolio. We know that. So in the alternative investment space, you know, wh where what role do alternative investments have in our portfolio? And uh, and what do you think are you know where would you put money? Uh, today? What kinds of alternative investments? So that's a really good question. And I, what I do is I like to hold up any alternative investment to the benchmark of the liquid markets. Most of the alternatives are illiquid. And even yes. though hedge funds trade liquid securities, you can't go in and out every day. So they're kind of illiquid in my book. And so you have to be, in my view, and the fees tend to be higher in alternative investment space as well. So you have to be able to do something that's different from from the the public markets, the liquid markets, I think, in order to be invested in an alternative. I think hedge funds, what we're seeing, what I'm seeing a lot is big institutional investors, particularly big pension plans that have a lot of interest rate risk. When they look at where the bond market is today and the kind of risks that they have to take um, to buy debt to yield four or 5%, Many of them think that investing in hedge funds, which will give them a similar return payoff, is a much safer thing to do. So we're seeing a lot of people, a lot of big investors have a lot of interest rate risk and worry about rates um, and have to have, they can't just have equity investments, you know, thinking about substituting a hedge fund. I think there's a massive debate going on right now in private equity, to be, to be really blunt. Um, over the years when I was in this industry, well, private equity didn't really exist. But but when, when it started to come around, you talked about getting returns that were four to six percentage points, four to 600 basis points higher than public markets. Right. I, 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 I actually uh, got off an investment committee two years ago for um, a foundation because one of the things they wanted to do was put a lot of money in private equity, but they expected the return to be the same as the S&P 500. And so I'm, I'm like, why are you doing this? This doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think, you know, understanding that their venture capital, again, 15 years ago, this is the advantage of having a lot of gray hair. 15 years ago, I couldn't get anyone to look at venture capital. If you looked at the past historic uh, returns 15 years ago, they were really, really lousy. Who did venture capital? What a stupid idea. It, it, would, it had all the returns from the internet bubble. Remember pets.com? Right. Um, no, exactly. investing in these little startup companies, that's what venture capitalists it was, do. It was all a fraud. They used to do, now, right. Now, the biggest determinant among some of the top leading in endowments is how much you have in venture capital, and this is the hot place to be. So, And then we're seeing the emergence of private credit, which is often direct lending to entities who want to, who want to find sources of capital but don't want to go through the public markets. Um, because of the cost and the size, and they often are small, or small borrowers are only going to borrow. Believe it or not, twenty-five million is a small amount to borrow. So, I think that the, I've always been a very big proponent of understanding and benchmarking it to some extent against the the public markets. I don't think as many people do that as they think. Instead, they tend to say, "My hedge fund's better than my other hedge fund." Well, why don't you look at a junk bond? They kind of have similar return patterns. You got to decide. You know, you should only be investing in hedge funds, in my view, if you think they're going to do better than junk bonds. What about private equity? Again, they should be doing better than the public markets. Mm -hmm. um, because you're paying more. Again, you're paying a lot more for these things. Yeah. Exactly. And a lot of a lot of venture capitals in tech these days. So you should compare it to tech and you should side. the and, and so those are important things for me. And I think about it as a substitution exercise, much more than having a capital market outlook that's different than the public market. So, uh, Andrea, what, as far as investment strategy, given where we are in the equity markets and the fixed income markets, and, you know, we didn't really talk about the fixed income markets, but, you know, they've had a 40-year, uh, they've been in a 40-year bull market as uh, interest rates have declined since, you know, early 1980s. So, you know, what, what's, what is your take on investment strategy in the late stages of it, certainly the fixed income market, and possibly the late stages of the bull market, even though there are people out there who would definitely disagree with me. 
Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. And a lot of people have been asking themselves whether a 60-40 mix is always the right thing to do or whether you should be thinking about, you know, more about taking more risk when when volatility is lower and maybe uh, less risk when volatility is Hi, and I don't want to advocate market timing by any means, but I think re rethinking that equity uh, bond mix is, a, is right. not a bad idea given where rates are, especially rethinking the long end of the of the uh, bond maturity structure because it's you know you're you're taking on a lot more interest rate risk and you're not getting that much more in terms of yield or expected returns. Um, in terms of you know equities, alternatives, all of that, I remember, and this might have been the last time that Jane and I were together in a room in person, a big, big room. But people, it was you know post crisis, and people were calling the U.S. the cleanest pig on the you know, yes, planet. right. It's like you know every <laughs> everywhere is bad, but maybe the U.S. is not as bad as everywhere else. I think that people are not saying that this time. And, you know, that wasn't a crystal ball because that was already probably six years post-crisis. So people were just, no, you know, kind of hindsight quarterbacking. Um, but I do think, you know, maybe we're going to see some, uh, the, like the academics would tell you we have a home bias, we should be more diversified internationally. And I'm I'm hoping that, you know, that this message will um, will uh, be uh, validified, you know, going forward. We won't just see, you know, the U.S. S and P five hundred kind of in hindsight uh, looking like the the only game in, in, uh, in town. Right. I, it, last thing I just want to say on this is, you know, just to echo everything that everyone has said. When you decide where to put your money, think about what that firm can do with your money. You are handing money for investment to a firm. What are they going to do with that? Are they going to put it into cash? Are they going to buy another firm? Or are they going to start some cool new thing that's going to produce cash flows down the, the road? So put yourself in the hands of, you know, what? who do you want to be using your money? Critical question. And the last question of this this uh, segment is, is going to be for Katie. And, and just all of the, the changes that you've talked about as far as the diversification. It's something that Research Affiliates has been talking about for a long time. And yes, Katie, you were, Research Affiliates was early <laughs> in, uh, in, in going with, with these laggards. But I want to bring up one more topic, and that is um, ESG. So environmental, social governance, uh, talk about a big investment trend. And uh, so if, if we were to look at uh, kind of the the, the products, you know, where there's going to be cash flow generated, uh, is ESG one of them, and is research affiliate? It's creating, you know, new products in that area. Yeah, absolutely. But I want to make one comment uh, on the back of Andreas, yes. um, because I totally agree that static sixty forty or static glide path are are bad because you some you know you've got to pay attention to the valuations and you've got to pay some attention to the the forward potential. Um, so anything static is problematic in my mind. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up, Andrea. Um, on ESG, uh, ESG is a, a ticklish subject in the investment space. A lot uh -huh. of people think if you narrow your um, the universe, then you're going to get a suboptimal view. I right. would say if you've got good uh, financial engineers like UCLA produces, we've got a number of them. Um, you can uh, can adapt to the you know what you're taking out. So if you take out quality companies in uh, let's say the sin stocks are known, you know the the tobacco and alcohol, right? Defense uh, because you have a ESG or a social responsibility that doesn't want to own those sectors. You can replace the missing quality with other. You can re-engineer your portfolio and replace that uh, factor, if you will. So we're a big believer that you can, um, with good, you know, create a good investment product and reflect an investor's personal beliefs on ESG or diversity or other factors. One of the things we're working on quite a bit now, and it's leading in Europe, not surprising, are um, a lot of the big asset owners there want to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh -huh. So we have uh, a, a number of products that are rolling out in Europe, which are glide paths to lower carbon footprints, essentially. 
in your, uh, it's, we call them climate transition portfolios, but they have the same underlying investment um, characteristics of one that doesn't reduce the carbon footprint, but it will allow particularly the public um, and some of the individual investors who really want lower carbon footprint in their investment vehicles, an opportunity to have a good investment product and a lower carbon footprint. Interesting. And these are indexes? Yep. Yep. That, that is definitely a trend in the future. So let, let's, uh, and, and we can talk more about this. So, so before we switch to how you got where you are, um, Jane, do you want to comment on, are, are you seeing trends in ESG investing in the alternative space? Um, not really. Not I'm really. seeing a lot of talk about it, but when people go to alternatives, they tend to go to alternatives for the return. And as Katie said, um, right. you know, you, over the past few years, it, you've been able to get a lot of return out of tech, which on most ESG metrics scores really well. But I know a lot of people right now that are looking at a lot of the um, oil and gas infrastructure, which seems to be very cheap, you know, sort of a value play and obviously mm -hmm. that would be out. And so not much on the, on the, on the okay. alternative space. And, and Andrea, are, are, are you, are, are, what kind of an impact do you think that this trend, the flow of funds to ESG type of products, what kind of an impact do you think it's going to have on the capital markets um, and, you know, different sectors, individual companies, is it going to be large impact? That, well, it's certainly going to be large for, on a, from a marketing perspective. Right. That's true. <laughs> I mean, a lot of ESG is about marketing. And when mm -hmm. you think about what you want to do with ESG investing, you're trying to change the cost of capital for firms' investment projects and make it cheaper to invest green and make it more expensive to invest brown. Um, there are probably better ways to do that. And I think probably Europe is a little ahead of us on that side. And, mm -hmm. you know, because we, we, it, we can use taxes and subsidies to, um, you know, encourage green investment and discourage brown investment. It's going to be a lot, it could be cheaper for us to pay those taxes than to spend a lot on marketing ESG funds and try to get people to pay more um, and earn lower returns for, for green technology companies. I hope that's a conversation that's happening, but <laughs> no. Not sure it is uh, among investment firms, but you can tell us at some point if it is. Uh, careers, L let's, you know, we're looking at you three um, and, you know, just thinking how, what, how influential you all are and what terrific careers you have and wondering how you got there. So Jane, I'm gonna start with you and let's just start, you know, when you were, I don't know, in high school, when you started thinking about finance, and your education. So, you know, talk to us about kind of how you got started. Okay, well, I was always, a, I was pretty early in the computer science space. And I was more interested in math and computers. Yeah. And then when I was in college, um, I ended up doing some work on, um, what's, what's an early event study, it's called an early event study. I ended up doing that as my senior project, but it was more about writing the algorithms, correcting the data, going through the research process, not so finance oriented. And actually my advisor, I wanted to know what I was gonna do and I got up and talked about the evils of investment banking. I kind of lectured a very prominent professor about it. He was very nice. He kind of, I think I saw a 22 year old or 21 year old young woman and <laughs> kind of laughed to himself. And I do remember him saying very quietly, well, Jane, there are a few other jobs in finance. Um, so he actually introduced me to a, a fellow who had, who had been at Wharton for a while, who had gone to the real work to the to the to an asset management firm, and I kind and like I went the real to, world. You almost said right. Yeah, the real world. <laughs> and, and, and even though I was had a title and went to an office and everything, effectively I was more like his graduate student, and uh -huh. um, in terms of, of work, and and that's and I enjoyed modeling. I enjoyed figuring out puzzles. I was never a kid who followed the stock market. I wasn't one of those kids who in their high school years was reading annual reports. Um, to me, it was more like 
how do I model this? How do I get a better hit ratio? It, it, it was a puzzle, a competitive puzzle to solve. And that's what got me started in, in the space. Mm -hmm. um, rather than a, an intense love of what I call business or economics, it was just a puzzle. Right. And, and the, the PhD route, so you were really committed, essentially. Yes. Um, so I, I bounced this. around, I bounced right, around right. a little bit. And I, after a few years of work experience, and th th honestly, when you go back to school, my strong view is you should only go get a PhD if you ever want to be a professor. Um, there's plenty of good master's programs and other ways, and I've seen really good work. In fact, even if you pick up the journal Finance, there are often co-authors on papers who don't have PhDs. So you can do good work. It's a huge investment. But I thought my parents had been professors of medicine, so I knew I didn't want to do that. Right. But I, but I, I was familiar with the academic lifestyle, and I thought that might be a very interesting thing. And as I said, I was very interested in building models and thinking about data, and so it was the right thing for me. But as you can say, I lasted three years in it, and I was doing all this consulting, and then it was like, okay, wait a second, which job do I really want to do? And so I had to make a choice, and I decided I'd rather. I'd rather work in the real world because the time frame in academia is really long. You you write a paper, which is great, and I love doing the research, but then it doesn't see the light of day, particularly in the old days when you actually had to read these in journals, it doesn't see the light of day for two to three years. Whereas if you go and use your research in the markets, you'll know in a couple of months whether it's kind of working or not. So it's it's was much more gratifying for me. Okay, Andrea, that's your opening. You have chosen a life in academia and you've been teaching what graduate students in management for 20 years or something. Um, and you've done what, both. 20, 21st year, I guess. Yeah, so so talk to us about number one, your education and, and you know, did you know kind of from the get go that you were interested in finance, that you were interested in teaching? Talk to us about the early years. Sounds good. Yeah, despite my black background, I am in the real world <laughs> here in academia. Uh, but I do actually like to go and practice finance too, as as we talked about before, and you know, hedge fund world or asset management world, fintech right. uh, advisors now. Um, but I I grew up with parents that wanted me to make a living. Like it, I had to be practical. You know, I we were clipping coupons and drinking powdered milk and leaving our diesel car running in the winter. So, you know, and it was gas crisis in late 70s and all that. So I thought I was going to go to college and be an accountant. Right. And I went to University of Illinois undergrad as a commerce major. And I found economics as a commerce major, and I was so intrigued by the way economics could put a structure on really important questions. Um, and I actually did know then that I wanted to be what I thought of as an eternal student, um, which is, uh, I think, what it means to be a professor. You're always asking new questions. You, t you teach yourself along with teaching the world and teaching students. Um, so I yep, went to University of Chicago, got my PhD in economics and finance is a very exciting and macroeconomics, which are my two fields are very exciting at the University of Chicago. A lot of Nobel Prize winners in those fields and just great ideas and great seminars, great discussions going back to Katie saying the best ideas come from, you know, they're not individually generated. This comes from standing on the shoulders of giants. So mm -hmm. grad school was a steep learning curve a lot of fun. When I graduated, though, I was interested in asset management. I interviewed for some internships and in investment banks at the time. This was the, you know, the late 90s. Um, but I thought, well, you know, I'll try academia. And if it doesn't work out, then it's easier to go back into asset management than it is to go from asset management into academia. I went to Kellogg and I had a really good time for 10 years and then, you know, visited UCLA and that was super fun. And I've been here for 11, 11 years research and teaching. So that's kind of the educational journey. And I teach MBA students, MFE students, PhD students. And I have to say, I love that part of my job. Mm -hmm. I, I looked at the participant list when we were first starting and this was fantastic. So please, anyone who's thinking about an MBA, apply to Anderson. I usually look at my class lists and as you know, it's 70% male and 30% female in the whole of Anderson. And then you go to a finance class and it's you know, going to be lower fraction of women. So all right. you women thinking about an MBA, 
uh, we would love to see you in finance in particular. Here, here, K Katie, your background, and, and again, you know, another PhD, but uh, you know, you had to start to early and um, at a lower level to get there. So, talk to us about your education and, and if you knew from the get go where you'd end up. I did not know. Um, at my age, it wasn't. Uh, I wasn't raised to go into the finance profession. And so I went to university as a history major. I love history. Mm -hmm. um, but I took economics classes. I took computer programming and I've always been good with math. And um, I was like, well, you know, I, I could read history anywhere, um, but this other stuff's really kind of interesting. So I went to the business school, um, did a double major finance and, and the management information systems at the time. Um, went out to work and realized that I was struggling a little bit to get respect and attention. I went to uh, corporate finance first and then the insurance industry and ended up going back to get my degrees, uh, mostly for credentialing and more qualifications. I love learning, love, I've always loved learning and loved university, ended up marrying a, a university professor and so uh, could see firsthand uh, the university um, professor side of things. But I realized enough about myself that I did not want to go the professor route when I graduated. And mm -hmm. I found a career path where I can uh, continue to learn, continue to promote education and promote education and research uh, through CFA Institute for years. Um, got a lot of global experience there and was active with Financial Analyst Journal and the Research Foundation. So I kept uh, an interest there. And then Research Affiliates is just a great place for people that love to learn and apply that learning in a practical way. So I, um, the credentialing, I, I love learning and I use the, the graduate degrees really to open doors and gain some respect in a very male dominated, the quant finance part of our uh, industry is, is right. still pretty male dominated. Let me ask you some something that you said earlier and and that was that you had a hard time getting respect from and 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 then you you know so therefore you went to get more credentials so i want to pick up with that is that because you are a woman or you know what what was what were you lacking that you were tr treated uh with less respect than you should have been you know given your skills well given the audience and the purpose of this program i would say uh in the when I was doing things in the 70s and 80s, I have plenty of examples where being a woman was not an asset, it was a detriment. And I wasn't listened to, uh, yeah. wasn't respected, walked all over and so forth. But as soon as I was Dr. Sherrod, um, it was a little bit harder for them to dismiss me as a, as a young woman that didn't know what she was talking about. Right. Now, I think things have changed. And you mentioned this a little bit earlier, Consuelo. They, I think it's changed a lot but it is still a challenge, I suspect, um, to, to be heard in, in our industry. Yeah. And Jane, you know, you mentioned earlier too, that, um, that you don't necessarily need a PhD, that if you have an MBA or whatever, did, did I hear you correctly? So, so what, what's your, your experience and what would your advice be? Did, did you have a hard time uh, getting respect? And, um, if, you tell me, and then did you ever? How did you overcome it, or whatever? Yeah, I mean, how do you call it? the world moves on, and there's still times. I mean, even with a PhD, I can remember I was in an interview once with a guy, and they looked at it was with a journalist, and she said, "Well, obviously you're very quantitative, and what are you going to bring to the table?" And the guy was sort of a marketing MBA type, you know, um, the worst. You know, just, <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> whatever. Um, I'm the one here who can program. I'm the one here who can build the models. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I think the world abounds with stereotypes. Our brains use shortcuts, rightly or wrongly, because there's just so much data. And I think it's really important to try to catch ourselves when we're doing that. But the nice thing about um, um, doing work is work's open to anybody. And there's even some really great... Um, like, like Rob or not, he's a genius, you know, and has done a lot of really great work. He doesn't have a PhD. I mean, you right. know, I mean, I think he's, I was joking with somebody. But he, is, he is really, really, really smart. I think <laughs> he no goes to Rob or not. no graduate degrees. Exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I definitely think, you know, 
you know, that's it. That being said, there is the pragmatic thing. And I think, right. you know, when I was starting, I'm, I'm an age between Katie and Andrew, more towards Katie's end. And when I was, women were just starting professionally in the industry. Remember those floppy bow ties and those Brooks Brothers suits? And, you know, you couldn't yes. even wear, I mean, you could Maybe. get a woman. You couldn't even wear pants. I mean, that was like right. my first job. That was not even like allowed. But but <laughs> I do think my boss, who was a really nice academic, you know, working in the real world, I, obviously I made this mistake and I didn't realize it. But he said my first, like my end of my first or second day at work, don't ever offer to get anybody coffee. They will think you're an administrative assistant. Right. And. And he said, I want you to go into every room and where you see the coffee pot and you sit on the other end and you just don't want to be helpful. You know, I'm a young kid, 22 years old, 21 years old, just graduating from college, wanting to be helpful. And I was falling into a stereotype and he didn't want to get me stereotyped like that. And I think wow, great advice. I think that's a really important thing, you know, that we can all help each other is, you know, speak up if you see someone say something or stereotype in the wrong way. But it, it just, you know, we're getting better. But we're just we're still moving to a perfect society we're not there yet and we just want to keep getting better yeah andrea you're you know did you have any similar you know lack of respect uh incidents and and if you did how did you handle them or maybe you didn't uh no it's it's a good question i think academia is a pretty small world and mm -hmm. so it's easy like stereotypes happen when when you have to use like an expectation about what someone's going to be like to think about them and in academia it's pretty quickly everyone knows who you are and so sort of forgets they know you're a woman but they kind of forget that and they think that's andrea eisfeld and she's been working on market liquidity or whatever it is where i went to school there were, um, I think, maybe one or none uh, female finance faculty members at the, you know, kind right. of during the time of my PhD. Uh, there was one really amazing uh, female professor in macroeconomics, Nancy Stokey. Um, so, you know, though, having one role model or, you know, I thought was, you know, important. When I moved into the asset management world, and this was 2015, so I was already 40 years old, over 40, um, nobody knew who I was anymore. So it might have been internal because I had to go in and just be me rather than Andrea Eisfeld with, you know, 16 years of experience and, and publications under her belt. Uh -huh. But I definitely felt that I didn't have the same respect that I had in my field where everyone knew who I was. Um, and it became important, like where you sit at the table, exactly as Jane said. And, you know, at what point do you speak? And those are things that I think, you know, people should be a little bit aware of just because people don't have full control over their brains. Um, so being a little bit aware of those subtle cues and um, things you can do to to make sure that everybody knows exactly what you're capable of are probably, you know, worth investing a little bit in. And, you know, again, I mean, the three of you do have PhDs. Uh, you know, you, you've gone that route. You're highly credentialed. I guess kind of for the rest of us and certainly in, in the audience, if they're MBA students, I mean, how important um, are those higher credentials at, at this point, especially to you know tear down that pink wall? Do you do you just you really need to credential up? I don't think it all has to be all um, with PhDs. That um, Jane has already commented on that. I think right. there there are other ways you can credential and and learn, but you cannot stop learning. The big mistake is just kind of to get in a in a particular position and stop yeah. because the world won't, you, the world keeps going. And so whether the credential is an MBA or going all the way to the PhD, if you really like the research and might want to do an academic stint um, or going the professional designation, um, the CFA approach for people while they're working or other options, but you have to keep learning. A commitment to learning I think is essential and showing that you're staying current. And yeah, go ahead, Jane. Can I jump in here for one quick second? So maybe this is helpful. I also, at one point in my life, was a pretty competitive athlete. And one of the interesting things that I learned, because I had to lift weights, that was, 
you know, to compete at the level that I competed at. That was part of things. In my day and age, girls or women didn't lift weights. That was before, <laughs> before Greece, before any of these things. <laughs> what was interesting is that women tended to be better weightlifters. And the reason was, is we walked into the weight room, we said, what is this? And we asked questions. And so we learned and we learned how to use proper form. So it was, whereas guys had this sort of peer pressure on them, they walk into the weight room, well, you're a guy, you should know how to do this naturally. And so they tended to have poor form. I think the same thing you can do with quantitative stuff. And if there's one plea I would make to people rather than going and getting degrees is to under, start understanding more quantitative information. You don't have to understand it at a super high level, but if you get the sense of it and ask questions. So for example, my niece has become a really good statistics person. She cried all the way through statistics. I took her to Nordstrom's to the shoe department. I had her find the average shoe price, the price that where 85% of the shoes are and 15% of the shoes. And for those of you who are statistically minded, you recognize I was plotting a normal distribution with one standard deviation. And she can have wonderful conversations and understand skewness and kurtosis better than most people because it's all in her brain in terms of shoes and i think right. the more that you take just one or two concepts and you understand them and you ask questions and you keep beating your head against the wall that really goes ways because the reality is women do get stereotyped that they're weak in this space and i think you know just being on t firm ground in a couple of places is a really wonderful place to be what a great teaching moment Quite honestly, let, let me ask you three, you know, again, leaders in your fields, um, leadership, uh, you know, post pandemic, I don't know if the post pandemic matters, but what are the new uh, leadership qualities uh, that that you think are going to uh, we're going to see in future leaders that we wouldn't have seen, let's say, 10 years ago? Well, I can start with that. I think one of the new qualities which ought to be a natural for most of the women leaders is more empathy for mm -hmm. the situation of the various team members and what they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, particularly you know whether it's family or whether it's a family in their household or their extended family far away and some of the circumstances that they deal with that um, people in the past maybe didn't pay much attention to and I think there'll be more requests for remote uh, remote working, in which case the management and the employees will have to adapt to how do you keep up the communication, collaboration, um, being able to assess performance and so forth in a, in a different type of world. And you certainly, as the CEO of Research Affiliates, you had to deal with a lot of different situations with various employees. And so the, the empathy and you act on that empathy, you actually, you, there, there's no set rule now. You're, you're much more flexible or you, maybe you always were as a leader. Well, I think the empathy with um, some of the cir circumstances that people had, uh, we have a lot of people that were not born in the United States and their parents are still around the world that they couldn't see and right. you know, creates different stresses and so forth. So there's some, um, being able to empathize with what they're going through, but then in managing um, more willingness to let people work from home more uh, as they're less, uh, for example, in our firm, um, very cautious about leaving their children with anybody else right now. So that means one adult in the family and you have to balance it. Mm -hmm. So it's not always the woman um, in, the, in, a, in a particular household is you know charged with being home if the children aren't in school or or mm -hmm. going to some other care facility so we're all having to adapt with those types of things yeah jane leadership qualities post pandemic um i think the the real issue for women to be careful about is and i felt very strongly is you can't it's hard to do everything and i grew up in the generation where it was sort of like 70s the end of the 70s when it was women's live and we can do everything you know bring home the bacon fried up in the pan and do everything and you really can't and i know in my case i i basically have had to have a house husband because there's no way we could have run our family right without right. it you know at the level i was working particularly when i was running pamco a global firm and 
I think what's hard is particularly when you're starting out and you are more of a two income family is women tend to rightly or wrongly get stuck a lot with the child care issue and that's a big issue. Andrea? Yeah, I always think it's funny when you meet, um, you know, women at the top, how many have a really great support system. I also have, I have two kids and my husband stays at home and is the main kid caregiver. Um, so a good partner is really important. Um, I'm, I was thinking about in terms of uh, leadership, I was thinking about, you know, the new MBA students and the new M MFE students and people who have started jobs in the last year and a half. And I think an important part of management is going to be to make sure that those people and the new hires coming after that don't fall through the cracks because this was a really tough time to get started. Mm -hmm. And and that was kind of the key thing for me in listening to Katie and Jane about, you know, kind of career advice is one of the things that I've seen with women in particular, you know, seeing MBAs and, you know, people with graduate degrees is just perseverance. I mean, every, careers like the good ones are going to go up and almost all careers actually go up on average, but they don't always go up. Sometimes they go down. Sometimes they plateau for a long time. Mm -hmm. And just keeping going is a really important part. Um, and so, yeah, a little bit of a little bit of leadership and a little bit of advice. Yeah, that's yeah. And, really good advice. I, go ahead, Katie. Just add to Andrea's point. The perseverance, I think there should also be introspection. Um, if something, if you're on a plateau or something's not working, um, is it what you really want to do? Because to continue to succeed and to continue to be energized and learn and, and so forth, you have to be doing what you like doing. And sometimes we get in ruts and we need to, yeah. we need to change. So I'm gonna to have to change <laughs> this conversation um, because uh, there have been some questions coming in that Laurie Santikian has been tracking for us. And so, uh, Laurie, do you have a, a couple of questions you want to ask the panels from our from our audience? Absolutely. And first, I want to thank you, Consuelo, for your terrific, terrific uh, conversation with the panelists. So, let's just... no, so much fun for me. Hello, round of applause. Thank you, panelists. Yeah. It's, it's hard to follow an expert. So I'm just basically facilitating uh, questions that, that came in from the audience. And, and there are a couple of common themes. Um, we, so switching back to some of the earlier discussions about markets, we didn't touch on real estate. And that does seem to be a topic that is on, on the minds of many of our participants. How do you think about the real estate market right now um, in terms of uh, both from the perspective of say, you know, residential homeowners and thinking about, you know, where prices will go in the near future, um, as well as thinking about real estate as maybe an income producing investment at, at, at this stage. I can maybe take that one to start. I've done some research on the returns to single family rentals and that included looking at house prices and rental yields. Um, and I've been, you know, talking to some asset managers in that uh, buy to rent space lately. Right. We saw some, it, it, we have a couple of things. I think we're still going to have pretty low interest rates for a while and real estate benefits from lower interest rates. It also tends to be an inflation hedge. So I think kind of looking at it from the perspective of the bond markets, it still looks pretty okay. We saw, um, you know, just in terms of the COVID and post-COVID, we saw really interesting things like people moving to the suburbs, people wanting more space, um, diff you know, different trends from the move to the city kind of things that we had seen um, previously. And, and depending on how we look, um, you know, when we all go back to work part-time, full-time, I mean, people have been at home paying their own IT, paying for their own office space. Our firm's going to want to pay for expensive downtown Manhattan real estate or will people still be, you know, doing their finance jobs from, you know, their homes in California or New Jersey or Connecticut? Um, so just a couple of thoughts on that market going. I don't I don't have any strong concerns. I think there are, you know, we're going to see a mix of what we had before people going back to work in the cities, uh, maybe, and, and but people, you know, also being able to work from home and wanting that more space. So maybe we'll have a little less of the dispersion in really high prices. You know, people have a little more flexibility to do the value investing because they don't need to be in downtown San Francisco or Manhattan. Anyone else? 
it's it's real estate residential real estate it is a really hot hot market right now i i can't remember what the figures are but it's basically you know the uh demand as far as outstripping supply so unless you absolutely have to i would say it's probably not a great time to buy a single family home especially if you know there's there are bidding wars going on that would be my two cents and you're having to waive all of your protections as a buyer, right? Waive all, all contingencies. Mm -hmm. um, another question, a slightly more specific about CLOs, so collateralized loan obligations. Do, do you think uh, CLOs will be facing a liquidity crunch coming up? Jane, do you want to take that or? Yeah, having done a fair amount on, on CLOs, it's been a couple of years now, but CLLs got into trouble, as everybody knows, in 2008. I think they are better structured and they've made some changes into it. I Clearly, the issue is with cash flow CLOs, you can't have the issue that, that some of the paper will fail. And at that point, I think you want to be very careful where you're in the capital structure. Um, you know, when people talk about CLOs, generally those AAA and AA parts are bought by big uh, life insurers and other insurance companies and other big institutional investors. So when you normally talk about, you're talking about the stub piece, the mezzanine piece or the equity piece, and you know, you get whatever the end and dregs are of it. So, um, you know, who knows? I do think, um, they benefit greatly because of the um, low rates. And I don't think a lot of people, I think people tend to think about credit, whereas a lot of them, if rates go up, that could be more problematic because of the way they're structured. So a more sort of career oriented question, as um, MBA students or other master's students or even college students start, start to graduate and go into these jobs, as Andrea said, it's, it's a very difficult time to be starting out. But sort of more generally, what should students be looking for in, in companies? What types of cultures and what signals are there, credible signals in um, how companies are organized and what um, activities they have and sort of way that they structure things that is supportive of, of women advancing? What should they be looking for in a company to decide whether or not to um, invest the early stage of their career development there? Can, can I just say that Katie should take that right off the bat because um, she w wouldn't say this, but I would say it. I think she's created uh, a terrific culture at Research Affiliates and she's you know rightly proud of it. So Katie, please answer that. Oh, thank you. You're too kind. Um, I think the one of the things I learned years ago from somebody I respect is that um, you, you got to go further, further than the words. Almost everybody's going to say they have a great culture and almost everybody's going to say that they're going to nurture and develop everybody they hire. So you need to look and see. Um, if you look at the senior team, is it diverse? Um, are they are there mentoring programs? Uh, do people respect the other other people's point of view? And re really, it's it's not just what people say, but also it's really important to do two things. One is look and see how diverse the senior team is, and second, when you're interviewing, ask questions about whether your voice is being heard, whether or not. It, the, the meetings are actually productive and collaborative or whether it's, you know, basically somebody talking to you. So you, there are lots of things you can look at to try to assess whether or not it's a culture where your voice will be respected and your hard work will be respected. Anyone that's my short answer. That? I can talk all night, Consuela, but that's no, my no, short but, answer. But, you know, right. But, yeah. um, but if, if you're, if you're, you know, kind of just starting out or you're a newly minted MBA, I'm, just thinking, um, you know, sometimes there might be a company or that you really want to work for or in an industry and that's the opening that you've got. So as much, as wonderful as that should be, but maybe can you see yourself as an agent of change and, you know, take a job if it looks really attractive, even if, you know, management isn't really diverse or they're, you know, they're not um, as open about or flexible well, think, with certain things. What do you think? I think the Especially, answer is yes. I yeah. mean, I did it. I mean, you did it. I'm, I did it. I'm Other sure people Andrea can do it. it, but it's yeah, hard, it. yeah. right? I mean, yeah. I think the people that have a lot of confidence and can carry a lot on their shoulders, 
Absolutely. Yeah. You have to pick your battles and you're probably going to get bruised a little bit along the way. and You may have to change companies before you get there, but absolutely you can do it. But the average person, you have to understand that that's the hard way. Mm. And, and I think the other thing that's really important right now, which I just want to underscore what Katie just said is super important, is talk to people, particularly around your levels, to how they're treated. Um, because you'll get a really good sense. And I do know several large firms that have a very, what I call, female unfriendly um, culture uh -huh. who are actually trying super hard to change right now and doing a lot of really positive things. And I know some firms that are more in the middle space. They're not great cultures, but they're not negative. And if I were a young person, I would probably want to go to the ones who want to change because you do change over time. So you know, you want to talk to people who are in the early years right there. What's going on? How does it really work? Do you feel yourself getting heard? That's really important. And I think it's very hard as a new person, particularly in a big firm, to change the culture. Yeah, I, I agree with all of those things. I was going to say, too, sometimes it's good to not follow people's advice and do the thing that people people are telling you. No one can do that because, you know, if you think you're that type of person, then you should definitely go the hard, harder road because you're paving that road uh, for other people. Um, so, so, you know, that can, that can be that can certainly be good, too. I agree, Andrea. I would just say that in the early years, sometimes that cuts off some of your opportunities. But as you get into positions where you are respected, then you can make more of a difference. And that can be quite rewarding. Yeah, I think it's such an interesting trade off because I kind of see two, uh, like two broadly, two career paths. You know, you started a big flagship firm that's probably uh, not as easy of an environment if they haven't institutionalized. Um, you know, diversity, or you started a smaller place where they're just, because it's a small numbers thing, there happen to be more women in leadership, but then, you know, you're starting not at a flagship. And so, you know, you, you're, you're, um, you know, going the smaller firm route where it's often easy to start the flagship and then go wherever you want from there. It's, it is an interesting question and it's definitely a matching problem of you, you know, with the type of uh, kind of culture that you're going to thrive in. Is it like the super competitive weightlifting culture and the one where they say, you know, girls can't do math and you're like, heck yeah, I can and I can code too. Or is it going to be, you know, one where you really need that friend to go to lunch with and you really need a female person and you're in the level above you? Well, so, so along those lines and maybe um, taking it a step beyond, so as, as Jane also mentioned, there, there is a lot of progress and, and you know, it, it's not quite as hard as it was during when, when Katie was first starting out, but it is still really hard to really go that last mile and break that glass ceiling, which, which all of you have done. Um, could you help everybody in the audience? So we have students, but we also have uh, mid-career professionals, sort of a wide range of, of, of women and men in the audience sort of thinking about these things. So can you help the women in the audience think about how to set a, a strategy to help really go that last mile and break beyond? Um. I could start. Um, don't lose. Don't ever give up. I mean, if you if you've set that as a goal, um, study the the skills that you need of, uh, to accomplish your goal. And one piece of advice I would have: a lot of people get stuck by being an expert in a very very narrow slice of the company, and it's very difficult to go from an expert in a narrow slice to managing the total. And so if somebody has aspirations for senior leadership, they'll have to plan through their career to get exposure and experience to various parts of the company so that they can look at the company as a whole rather than the narrow slice that they might be an expert in. And I think that for me, looking at other people, a lot of very bright contributors get stuck because they can't see the entirety of the firm um, they, they don't have the vision or they don't have the background and experience to be able to manage the total piece. Jane or Andrea, do you want to 
I, I think just comment pulling on two threads. I really agree with what Katie said, but also pulling on what Andrea said is that depending on where you are in your career early on, there's more stereotyping. Yeah. Which firm did you start at? Where'd you get your degrees? Can you program? You know, whatever. They're, they're going to go through all those, all those issues. Um, as you get to be more and more senior and sort of in the mid career, if in my strong view of watching this industry over the long haul, it's sort of by your early forties, you know, people are kind of, they're sort of narrowing what you call the gauntlet for very senior management, not always, but that's kind of the realistic thing from where I'm sitting. And so I think what's important is if you're in your thirties or your late twenties is starting to do what Andrew said, Academics is way smaller and everybody knows who everybody is within reason. This is a much bigger issue out here, out of the academic world. But start writing a couple of pieces and put your name on it. Um, go to conferences, participate in panels, do things where, and I think one of the problems is, and I think this is where as women we tend to do a weaker thing, is I can't tell you the number of men I've met who basically show up to panels. I've done a lot of these discussions over the years. Okay, what's the subject? What am I doing again? You're like, how much prep did you do? And then you sit there with your four four pages of notes and your thoughts all well organized. And I think when when you're given that opportunity, you need to grab it. And you can't wait for the perfect opportunity because those opportunities, particularly when you're making that transition to be more of a name, so you become less the person at Research Affiliates, you become Katie at Research Affiliates, and then finally Katie Sherrod, who happens to work at Research Affiliates. I mean, that that's kind of what happens. And you just, as you manage your own brand there, when you're given those opportunities, you really have to take them because if you aren't if your circle of acquaintances externally to the firm is really small by the time you're 40, you're going to have a very hard time, in my view, um, being a, a, a business generator, a revenue generator. And it's whether it's through your investment ideas, it doesn't mean marketing, but just your investment ideas or people want to trust you. And if you don't have the trust of, of, of people, it's really hard. I mean, that's all being CEO is, is having the trust of everybody who, who, who's working for you that you can lead the company. I love that idea of, of saying you have your own brand. I mean, you really, you do have, don't be afraid to, to promote yeah. everything good that happens to you in every environment that you can and make yourself necessary, you know. Um, I love that. I like that idea of everyone knows what you're about. And, and there's another great, like one of my friends, she wanted to expand things. And so she just started volunteering um, on investment committees for small nonprofits, the asset amounts were super small, like $20 million. But that's great because she got to meet a lot of people and like met the founder of TCW and met the founder of a lot of these places. You know, so there's a, you know, start building that network. The other thing I love that you said is don't assume that you can't do something. So, you know, don't be afraid to come to the panel <laughs> without knowing exactly what you're going to say. Don't be afraid to go on that investment committee that, you know, that you're going to you're going to be able believe that you will be able to do it. Every but everyone else is also learning by doing a little bit. So don't be afraid to say, no, you're not ready for that. I love that idea of, t of grabbing the opportunities and assuming you're going to do it and you're going to do it well. You know, this is what women don't tend to do, promote themselves. So this is a good ending, a good thought to leave us all with. So I want to thank all of our panelists. It was just a fascinating discussion. We could go on for hours and we'll have to have part two. Uh, and, and I also want to thank all of our participants and, of course, UCLA, the Fink Center, the Anderson School. And I forgot to mention uh, one of our community sponsors, the CFA of Orange County. They're always very supportive to us. Um, so I just can't say enough for such a wonderful session. So thank all of you. And now anyone interesting, interested in our networking, you'll find that in the chat box. There's a link. We can go there. Um, I don't know, Lori, any uh, closing comments from you? It was just a fabulous session. Thank you, Consuelo, too. And no, thank you all. It was a great session. So thank you, panelists. It was terrific. And great questions from Lori as well. Well, thank you to everybody, and um, we hope to welcome you to UCLA in person in the near future. Yes, yes, yes. in person thank in the you. near future. Yes. <laughs> All in the thank you room. so much.